You have to be comfortable in your own skin, um, know what you're worth and what you're putting out there. And I knew that, like, okay, there's a lot to learn, but I did know that if this person could do what I could do. Welcome to Quiero, a show about Latinx who want it all. I'm your host, Priscilla Garcia Jaque. Our guest today is Kevin Arbue. Kevin served as the VP of Talent at Lee Daniels Entertainment. Noted in Austin Film Festival's 25 Screenwriters to Watch, his career spans directing a Super Bowl commercial and viral videos, as well as his recent feature, Fair Market Value. Wait, okay, so you're from Brooklyn? You grew up in no, Brooklyn? No, no, no. I grew up in Long Island, Hempstead. I was born in Brooklyn. And then to a Haitian father and yes. a Panamanian mother. Yes. How do they meet? Do you know that's uh, college. Yeah, they met in college. My dad came from Haiti and started studying, and she was Panama studying, and then they had, you know, they um, kind of, like, liked each other, and then my dad got in the mail that he was being drafted, and he was like, okay, you're going to Vietnam. And he was like, will you wait for me? And she's like, if you come back alive and with all your limbs, sure. He was there for quite a bit, and then he came back, and they got married. I'm just very curious about your household and the way that race was talked about, the way that background was talked about how do you raise a black hispanic kid <laughs> um well i'm from the generation where just a lot of things are left unsaid i grew up in i mean this has different connotations now but, but i grew up in a very cosby household where it was upper middle class you know they were both in the medical field it was not that there wasn't a lot of hugging there was never like my dad never was like i love you but you felt it and you knew it you know, um, I'm very different with my kids because it's a completely different generation. Um, for my mom, it's like, you know, she's from Panama where there was still kind of this unspoken um, caste system between, because she's, she's my skin color, whereas her best friend was much lighter, you know. Um, but they were still like, oh, yeah, Panamanian, Panamanian. And then when she got to America, it was like, black girl. Right. And that was the first time I was like, I'm a what? What do you mean? Like, I'm Panamanian. It's like, no, you're a black girl. Look at the color of your skin. Um, and I think that happens a lot to, like, you know, Dominicans and whoever. If you're dark, it just gets boiled down to black. Um, for me, with my Haitian side and my Panamanian side, I mean, they're so different. But I just kind of gravitated more to the, the, the Latin side. And just, like, growing up, I was just friends with mostly... Uh, Latinos and Hispanics. It was just something that was... In Long Island? Mm -hmm. Like, that was a present community for you to inhabit? Yeah, um, and in Long Island, you have... Basically, it's Irish, Italian, Haitian, Salvadorian, Puerto Rican. That's mm -hmm. kind of, like, what inhabits Long Island. You are, you're a writer. I know you... As, I have met you as a writer. You are very yes. many things. You're a creator, you're a producer, you're a director. Right. You've been an actor in your life. Um, what is the inciting incident? that led you into this business? Maybe it was my brother. He, you know, the whole family loved movies. Like, that was a big thing. I would watch a lot of movies. Um, but my brother is the one who went to film school. Obviously, it was highly discouraged in, in my family to do any type of uh, creative endeavors. I mean, they were like, you got to be a lawyer. You better be a lawyer. But at a very early age, like, I, I just knew, and I kind of... 15 was a big year for me, and that's kind of when I stopped thinking. Well, I started, no, excuse me, at 15 I started, I started thinking. The idea of someone being an atheist or agnostic was just unheard of. Right. I mean, everyone was religious. And I remember my religion teacher was talking about evolution, and I, it was the first time that I'm like, wait, I kind of thought we all knew these were stories. And it was clear that she was taking things literally, and that's what made me go, wait a minute, are we all, wait, so we all don't realize that these are like stories and not reality? Right. Noah's Ark is something you believe in? This is insanity. Um, and that is when I was like, okay, so now that I know that you guys are being serious this whole time, uh, I gotta like look into what this whole religion thing is about. And once I started doing that, I was like, well, I'm out. This is not for me. And then it was also... I want something different than most people, you know, which is also very hard to do in uh, Long Island because there's not many uh, professions that you can kind of, you know. Choose from and... Right, right. And I remember when I started, like, telling people this is what I want to do, it's like saying I want to be an astronaut. It's the same level of... Uh, so you saw yeah. your brother go to film school and you're yeah. like, I want this. Yeah, I want, I want to make movies, yeah. Right, but you're self-taught. 
Yes. So eventually you did not go to school. Yeah, well, because I saw that it didn't help my brother whatsoever. Yeah, like the great yeah. keep, gatekeeping institutions were not really all that they were meant to be. He comes out of film school and then he's working on friendlies, you know? And he's not, you know, doing anything like film related. And I'm just like, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. And why not? And then I got older and um, it was around 18, 19. I'm like, I think you just need a certain level of hustle to make things work. And maybe you just pick up the phone and, and that's what I did. And that was kind of like my in. When I graduated, I just remember cold calling and cold emailing as many executives, as many people whose emails I could just find. Yep. Turns out that people are really receptive to that. Yes. Way back in the day, New Line Cinema was pretty much run by Mike DeLuca. Right. And I said, you know, I read, you know, the trades that he was gone. So like, and I knew that, you know, you just like this level of disruption when someone's leaving. So I called, called, uh, cold called New Line Cinema, and I was like, hey, um. So, you know, as you know, I was doing this deal with Mike DeLuca, and he's gone now. Like, I don't want it to fall by the wayside. Who do I talk to now? And the receptionist was like, oh, I think you need Kale Boyder. So, like, okay, great. So they transferred me to Kale. I'm like, Kale, hey, what's up, man? It's Kevin. So I'm sure Mike told you about the project we were working on, but, like, he's gone now. I don't want it to die. What, what do we should do? Oh, come on, what can we do? He's like, all right, all right, come on, and we'll talk about it. I mean, it was a lie. Everything I said was a complete lie. But because there was this assumption of, like, I was doing something and I was somebody, he, you know, we had a meeting and, I mean, it was crazy. Who taught you how to say, I, okay, I get to do this. Like, I get to do this, I get to say I'm this person, and I'm just going to, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, like, fake it till you make it, which yeah. goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. But, and you have to have a deep sense of self and knowing that you can and you will when that happens. I think if you kind of know who you are as a person, mm -hmm. then I, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, is that you have to be comfortable in your own skin um, know what you're worth and what you're putting out there. And I knew that, like, okay, there's a lot to learn, but I did know that if this person could do what I could do, and I think that's a lot of it is looking at kind of what's out there and going like, well, aside from, you know, if you're an absolute genius, that's one thing, but there's a lot of people working in this business that are not necessarily geniuses, and I'm like, why this person? Mm -hmm. And why not me? I am constantly amazed at people like Eric. Eric has such a great, fantastic sense of self. And I think, mm -hmm. like, I was raised in a very strict household that was very, I mean, my parents are loving in their very own way, but they are, their standards are, whew, man, yeah. you know? And I see someone like my own boyfriend who was, I think, in, in her wisdom, I think his mom knew that like raising a black kid in Baltimore was hard enough. Like, mm. It was just going to be hard enough for him. Right. So the house is a place where you are worth it and you matter and you're full of everything. Right. And as a result, like Eric has a much better sense of self and like worth than I ever, that I'm, I strive to be like that. Yeah, and I, and I do think a lot comes from the family unit. I mean, I just had amazing parents, very similar. I mean, especially, I, I, I think sometimes people don't um, appreciate their parents until they're much older. But there was this, like, like, you know, 15, 16, 17, I'm like, oh my God, my dad is amazing. Mm -hmm. And he's the only human being I know that doesn't have a bad bone in his body. He's actually like the most amazing human being ever. Ever. Right? Are your parents still married? Oh yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you started managing. Started, I started as a model agent first. Amazing. Which was like, I know, and like why yeah. and how? I saw in the paper that this modeling agency was looking for an office manager. And I go in there and I'm like, you know, like, yeah, I, you know, I could do that, but I think I would be better, you know, booking the talent. I could talk to the people, whatever. And they were like, okay, we'll try it out. And then I started doing it and it was like, mm. and it took, a lot of it was like, hey, look, we're a boutique agency. We can't call some of the bigger people. I'm like, why not? I'm like, well, you know, because, and, and this is back in like 99, you know, when it was really, it was just like Ford, Elite, Next, right. IMG, those was like the biggies. And I was like, no, but that's like, they'll t you know, that's them. And I'm like, well, I don't think that necessarily has to be, so let me call some of these people. Mm -hmm. Like, they're open to it, like, just ask. Just and a lot ask. of people were just not asking. Right. Just so ask. they appreciated that. And at that point, I was just about getting single, and I was young. And I'm like, being like a model booker, like it was like the most amazing thing in the world. And then like a year later, I'm like, this is the worst thing in the world. Like it was like soul crushing. Um, and it was the Why? first time, um, because you, I would find like a 15 year old girl 
who was like really smart and like had it and you talk to the parents I'm like listen I think she could be amazing and then she starts working and then a year later she's brain dead right and I'm like F-. and you just realize that there's just if your sole income is just what you look like and people are not interested in what you have to say I think just eventually you go well then fuck it and that part of your brain turns off and it becomes all about that yeah. and i'm like we're not even having an interesting conversation this is the saddest thing in the world right i read ashley graham's book <laughs> not that she like represents all models but i thought unless you are a brand you're a huge brand and you're a supermodel yeah not every part of you gets to be engaged Right. Yeah, and she's talking about, and that, and that is a completely different generation. I mean, she's a completely right. different. She's working where, she's she's working in that in that area where you don't need permission, mm-hmm. you know. And I was doing it in the area where it was like you got to go this route for these people, and this is it. There's no other way around it. And then I shifted into managing actors, right? Um, which was also great, and and hell became the worst thing in the world. Why? <laughs> um, a lot of the same things. Um, I repped one guy who came out of Juilliard and he was like, I just want to, you know, do this thing. And then he was in a really big movie. Um, and fast forward like five years later, he wouldn't even take a meeting with Ridley Scott or Ron Howard. And there was that moment where I spent like two weeks arranging travel for his dog because they were shooting something in Brazil. I'm like, get me the fuck out of here. He was, you know... And now I love actors again, but like it made me hate actors. It really did. Right. It really made me hate actors. Um, what was the next step from that? Like, you hate managing. Thank you for the lessons. Yes. What happens next? Uh, then I get into producing. Yeah. Um, producing, it really kind of levels a playing field because as smart as you think you are, you can do this with that. You can only get to a certain level with experience. Mm-hmm. And, like, looking back, like, some of the first things to produce, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm the dumbest dude in the world. Like, so many mistakes, and there's so many things that you think. What's the biggest one you've made? Biggest mistake? Yeah, that you can remember. Jesus Christ. Um, I think the the first big mistake, and I think a lot of the young producers make, not being properly staffed. You can only be the most inexperienced person on set. You have to surround yourself with people who have done it a million times before. That's the biggest mistake, is that, like, okay, this is my first thing, and I get, I'm get i going to get my friend to be the AD, and my friend to get this thing, my friend, and they're just as inexperienced. It's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a disaster, and whatever your budget is, it's going to be blown, because you don't, you don't quite understand that there are certain positions that pay for themselves, like production managers and line producers. Their position pays for themselves, because they're going to get deals that you can't get. You know what I mean? Like, a good production manager or line producer does not pay retail. And you don't know that in the beginning. Like, you, like I need a certain lighting package, and you call the rental place, and they're like, this is the quote. And you're like, okay, this is the quote. When you realize, you start doing it, well, oh, no, I want 30% off. And you'll get it. You know what I mean? And that 30% off just paid for that entire salary of the line producer. So you blew up because of a viral <laughs> I Have a Crush on Obama yeah. video. Yeah. I read somewhere that you found this on Craigslist. Uh... I answered an ad in Craigslist, and your the guy whole was life like, is like answering <laughs> ads and like cold calling. It is, like, yeah, that's how it, it that's, is. That's the bit, yeah. I, so I I became the vice president of Lee Daniels from Mandy, for you know it was like the version of Craigslist. That, oh, I mean, yes, yes. It wasn't like a so it was literally answering an ad. I can't believe, yeah. And then what happened? It was the same thing. It's like he was looking for an office manager. Yeah. And I was like, hold up. Where was he in his career at the time? He, this is funny. He had Where just done Monsters Ball. Uh, so he was bigger than shit. Yeah. Like it was crazy. Working for Lee Daniels was mind blowing because my whole half that career up until then has been boutique, 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 boutique. Then I go to Lee Daniels where, you know, it had been a huge movie. Uh, you know, Haley Berry had just won. Um, the Oscar, and it became like he could call anyone and they'd pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I could call anyone and pick up the phone. How your calls get returned, I I realize now, is really shows where you are in the business. Oh, man, yeah. I think that everyone should work at an agency and learn that. Yes. I feel I... I am so much more empowered in my own career and my own, like, Mm move-making because of that experience. Yeah. And it was like, I started Beatley Daniels and I'd call the biggest agent in CAA and it was like, hello, mm-hmm. what can I do for you? Mm-hmm. I mean, at the beck and call. 
And Lee would blow these guys, he would curse these people out and they'd call back for more. Like, it was crazy. I mean, it was so, like, he was, Lee Daniels was a person who taught me that you can be a business person and a creative person. And I think Which that kind was... kind of shaped your life. Yes. In the end, that is, that is the lesson of your life. Yes. You know, and it's always the most empowering thing about you in the room. I think, yeah, it, it, it comes down to, like, listen, I can talk about the script, I can do this thing, but I can tell you on the production side how certain things are going to work, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I mean, talk about Does that get in the way when you're writing? No. Okay. I think it helps to a certain extent. If there's if if I'm writing something that I know for a fact I really want to direct this, then I'm gonna write for a certain budget, a certain thing. Like I'm, I just think realistically, I could do this, mm -hmm. and like and I'm not trying to write you know Transformers ten agents as you know. Uh, and for just always talk about voice, and like you'd have a certain voice, mm -hmm. and it took me a while to find that and be comfortable with it, mm -hmm. because because you know. As you know, there will be certain people who will read even the script you like and be like, this is fucking ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like, this guy's all over the place. Like, this is, you know... Because I don't... I'll do things on the page that make me laugh. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, you do... You write You write for both things. You do write with the reader in mind, which I yes. also think is such a big part of the kind of relationship that a reader can have with your script. Right. I would think so, but there are some people who are like, God damn, this is so overwritten. This is so... What is going well, on here? And I'm like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of, I think I'm like, um, but then you know, listen, not everyone's for everyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I, re I read about like people's reaction to you know Tarantino's script, you know, True Romance, like this is horrible. Like people hated it. He didn't change any words. It was just you know like Lawrence Bender read and was like, oh, I like this. You have one of the best work ethics I've ever kind of encountered in an artist. Yeah, yeah I do. I mean, I, to me, it's always like you are very, you know, the executive world. And so you have amazing email etiquette. And you like, <laughs> I mean, all your deadlines and like, but I do wonder where that came from and like who taught you that or if you've always been that way, your dad. Well, let me do that. And again, unspoken, but like, if you have a father that is so responsible mm -hmm. and like such a good person, like... You see it enough, you realize like, oh, okay, you gotta, you gotta be decent in, in this world, and it's interesting. Like my son, who's eighteen, like, the difference again like, generations. Like I sat down and talked to him about a lot of this stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At a young age, and he gets it to like, a whole nother level, a whole nother level. But he's also like, <laughs> my son is like, he was, he has it in both hands. He's very, very smart, talented, and a hustler. And he's ridiculously good looking. And he kind of like puts these like things together. And he just, you know what I mean? Like, People so like that can't be stopped. It, he, my son will not be stopped. <laughs> oh, you know, my, my brother, my oldest brother now is going into politics as well in Colombia. And my father comes from not cute Colombia. And he, I think forever, will have this underdog complex that just needs to get worked out right. and remuscled and again needs to get taken to the mat and I remember the first time he saw my brother speak and he just looked at my mom and I and he was like he doesn't feel that mm. like my brother just walks into a room and knows he can own it right that weight is never on him and I thought that is generation big time I that is so and you know because if anything my dad does not he's not very non-confrontational um, to a fault, I think, because I think it leads to bad things, you know, at times. Whereas just generation, like, so I don't have that thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I confront, 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 confront. I think people understand that it's not out of malice or ridiculous. It's just like, I'm just kind of like, God, it's just fucking really, like, you know, just, you have to take in some sort of context. You know what I mean? I think, um, especially as artists and creators, now we're feeling like the, um, there is, uh, Forget political correctness, there's a stifling of certain things and certain mm -hmm. ideas where it's like, you know, I had a friend who um, was the, you know, co creator of that show Confederate and, and, and HBO, and he got so much shit. And it was like, guys, can you just wait to see, like, holds up? Like, why are you judging? You, have, you haven't read it, you don't understand really the nuance of it, but it's like the optics, it just sounded bad. Mm -hmm. So people attacked this, these two black people, you know what I mean? Like, not realizing, and like, essentially kind of like killed the show from these two black creators because it just sounded kind of bad. That's a problem. That is a big, big problem. Because it used to be like you can, you know, there's a lot of like, well, I don't even want to hear this person speak. And I'm like, but that's the way 
the way to eradicate bad ideas is to debate it so everyone can see that it's a bad idea. But if you try to stifle it, it will grow. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you on this, but I, I think that the point is that for such a long time, there was only one part of the group that got stifled and then the other right. part got just like a free card to go and run around mm -hmm. until like the other side gets to make the same argument that you're trying to make is from the from the position of power. We're not there yet. I agree with that. I think the basic problem is, is that there's been a lot of scapegoating, right? So, for instance, you will hear a lot from specifically white women that, you know, about white men. So a lot of times they are, they are using white men as a scapegoat, but there is this reality where they don't hire black men. So if you look at, like, the entire career of Nancy Myers, who I think is a very good director, she has never hired a person of color as a lead or even supporting. Saint, my, one of my favorite directors, Nicole Hollow Center, you know, once, her first movie, never again. It happens a lot, right? And, and, and this, is the, this is the biggest joke, and I think you and I will agree with this, is that we operate in what's considered to be a very progressive industry. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, like, it's the most racist industry ever. And this is just the reality. A white man in charge will hire me much quicker than a white woman in charge. And that's just been your experience. That's, yeah. And, 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 only, and, not, and it's not a... And the funny thing is, and then you have to take in context... It's usually not a conscious choice. It's usually just you hire people who you hang out with. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that white, white women in progressive just don't hang out with black men. When you are um, filling your own crew, mm -hmm. is, that, is race something that you consciously think about? Yes. I do believe you have to create opportunity for certain people so it becomes easier for them next time. So like my last you know, film where you know, it was a, a female lesbian AD or, and then like a Japanese DP... And then the black second AD, and then you know, so it's very, very, very mixed. And I do do that consciously. And you know, I, I, I've saw some people like, well, that's not fair. So you look for the best person. And I'm like, no, that's just you say that because just just they've had all the opportunity forever. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I have to make sure you know that this person who has uh, aspirations of being an AD, she can be an AD, and then grow and grow that out because now she's a kick-ass AD. And she's hired other people, you know what I mean? Like, and so I am all about like, I want, I do want great, obviously, but you just got to give a certain opportunity so it can grow. Of course. Yeah. And develop skill. Yes. Give the opportunity to develop skill. Because there's nothing more uncomfortable as, because a lot of times where, like, being the only such and such sucks. Yes. And I can't stand going into a set or this, whatever, and I'm the only black dude. And I'm like, what the fuck? You got to do better. You got to, you do have to and make so choices. it's so easy to do better. It's just about extending just a little bit outside of the circle that you've just always surrounded yourself with. Mm -hmm. um, you're writing full time now. Yes. Like your focus, you have, you have claimed this writing <laughs> life and you will, you're going to do it. What yeah. does that look like? I think you have to be a pragmatist and you have to be realistic and you have to be patient. Um, patience is probably the hardest thing to have because you feel like you're kind of at a certain level. And you're like, guys, come on, let's go. But you start to realize that other people have different priorities, so you're going to have to slow it down and go, it's going to happen when it happens. It can be frustrating, and especially, I think, when you have a, a family. You know, it would be a lot. If I was a single person, I'd be pretty content, you know, because I make enough where it's like, oh, that's, you know, I'm, I'm good. I can travel, I can do whatever. But I live in New York, and it's a family of five. You know, so there's always that like, oh, Jesus Christ. Because, I mean, if you are in this business, you're a freelancer. It doesn't matter how much money you make, you freelance, you know, and you don't know when the next job's going to come. So you're constantly kind of terrified, like, what is, you know what I mean? But I think you have to calm down. But, yeah, it's tough when you see people who sell their thing at 21 years old to 22. And I'm like, you know, if, if you're like a Damien Chazelle, it was just, it's, it's really like, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. And you try to hold on to the stories of people who make it later in life. I mean, Morgan Freeman, like his first big role, he was 51. I mean, I don't know how you continue going that long without, I mean, that's difficult. I mean, I'm 40 now, right? Um, but and you've been a father for... I've been a father since I was 22 years old. I have an 18-year-old right. son. Like, you, know? you no longer remember what <laughs> it is to not have a child. I don't. It is, it's been part of it. Um, and it's weird because, you know, last year... You know, I was voted one of the top 25 screenwriters to watch for that year. And I'm like, wow, that's great. You know what I mean? And I had this assumption, okay, well, now 
this is a major magazine, and it's, and it's this, it doesn't get more validating than that. And it was like, cricket, cricket, cricket. Mm. And I'm like, really? Like, what is what else needs to happen, you know? And then at the same token, so I was at um, a festival, and uh, um, I was talking to a woman named Gita, who not only won Austin screenwriting, won the Nichols. Mm. Crickets, crickets, crickets for her. And I'm like, okay, well, then there's, you know, that right there just tells you, it gives you some perspective. That is not just me. It just happens, and it's, it's just weird, you know? I think what also is difficult is that when people see me, they want, especially back in the past when I started writing, you wanted a certain type of story. Coming from you. Yes, yeah. and when I tell you that, when I say, like, I really love Mike Nichols and Nora Ephron, they're like, but we don't want that type of black guy. Uh. Could you be the black guy that does Boys in the Hood too, and not? You wrote one of my favorite screenplays I have ever read. Oh. The screenplay is like, I mean, for those who will see it soon enough, <laughs> it's a mix of like Tomb Raider and Kill Bill mixed with Boys in the Hood, and then also some weird Japanese horror film. <laughs> I mean, all in one, and it yeah. is so captivating and funny and it just moves and then you realize why doesn't this happen all the time yeah. right that's that's the difficulty and, and you know you, you need to convince someone like hey look this is something i think people are getting it now because just box office it becomes undeniable um what what's the next step like what are you looking for forward to well so i wrote a a, a, a pilot uh, <laughs> with uh, alex Danilaris. Um, and that is amazing because, I mean, he, that is a great example of someone um, with a certain amount of clout taking a chance on someone else. That's a huge example. Um, I, I don't know if he realizes, like, like how big that is mm -hmm. in someone's career because there's no real way to get to the level as people do that. Uh, I'm in the midst of uh, attaching an actor to a, a film that I'm... Going to be co-directing. Like, I was supposed to, like, just kind of brush up this script that came to me and ended up doing a page one rewrite, like, completely new script. Um, it's being produced by Shannon McIntosh. Amazing. Because I did, so I did make a conscious choice um, to work with women yeah. years ago. Those I was awesome. Uh, <laughs> I was at an agency, uh, one of the big ones. I wrote uh, this pilot, and a TV agent was like, I love this, but you got to change the woman to a man because no one's making shows for women. And I was like, peace. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was fucking ridiculous. Um, so it's also I, like so incorrect. I know. I mean, like really, it's, it's not just, even like, financially. Yes, yeah, like, incorrect. It's, it's like a big. It was like a weird thing to say. It's based on nothing, you know. Yeah. Like it's just weird, weird thing to say. But I was like, okay, I gotta get out of here because like, if you're saying shit about like women, you're gonna be saying shit about black people or whatever. It's not. How often is it just as one you know marginalized group that you have a thing? You know what I mean? So I was like, let me get out of here. Um, so then I just wrote everything starring women. Every, I mean, everything was starring women. Everything, everything. Um, and then I just, you know, I just certain producers I wanted to work with, and I'm like, who's Tarantino's producer? Mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, Shannon McIntosh, you know? And um, I was at this festival. I had a movie in a festival, and I saw that she was one of the speakers. So I was like, okay, computer. I got her email address, and I wrote her an email, and she wrote back, and she's like, yeah, let's meet, meet up after the panel. So we met, you know, that night, and we talked for like an hour. Um... And she's like, okay, well, send me your script in this movie, whatever. And I was like, sure. And then I sent her the script. She called me like a week later. And she's like, yeah, so I read your script. And, you know, when you talk to a lot of people, there's a certain, there's a very similar conversation you have. You expect to hear certain things. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you know, I definitely expected to hear like, so, yeah, you know, I, I kind of like what you wrote. But, you know, I'm busy right now. And, you know, kind of keep me in mind for whatever. That's what I expect to hear. But instead, she was like, so let's do this movie. And I'm like, what? She's yes. like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, she's great. I mean, like, so she has this new movie with Tarantino now. She just got Lino DiCaprio to star, which is not so. What is the what is the hardship that you went through that you carry through today? I don't know about hardships. I'll just say that I think owning your mistakes is very big. And I, and I talk to a lot of people when they tell a story of something that a production that went bad or this script or this didn't sell, whatever it is, and it's always someone else's fault. And every flag goes off when I hear that. I'm like, it's always someone else's fault. Always. Like, it's never because of the shit you did. Yeah. And I can very easily look back on my filmography and be like, 
this fucked up because of this, because I did this, right. or I did fucked up here, and, you know, very, very easily. I mean, like, there is one project that I, I, I wrote where the script was, like, people got so excited about the script, um, and the actors kind of, like, gave it their all, but what I was trying to do it was the wrong tone completely, mm. but it's like, you gotta disown that stuff because it's the only way you can get better. It's the only way. And I love, and, and then it gets to a point where it's like adverse. And that's why, like, not politically, but like, you know, I'm someone who was a parent and has kids. So I recognize how important it is that they do overcome adversity. Mm-hmm. And so much of what's going on is trying to uh, deter adverse situations. I'm like, no, but we need those. those I'm are just huge. reading Brené Brown and her whole thing is about that. That in the way, it's all about belonging. Like the whole mm-hmm. book is about belonging. And it's the idea that we have protected ourselves so much from the hardships of life that we end up doing the biggest one to ourselves right. because now we're secluded and we are lonelier than ever, which right. is the biggest heartbreak in life is mm-hmm. loneliness in that way. But yeah, like overcoming adversity is the only way you'll know how you will react and, and, and pivot. How many people do we know that they have a certain plan and as we know, things shift outside the you know, world and they can't pivot. They can't shift. Mm-hmm. They can't make that, th- you know, that change, you know, to go to a, a better place because they've just never had to overcome certain adversity. Oh. It's a disaster. Kevin, I am so so grateful that you're here. I th- uh, thank you for inviting. This is this is great. I, I love this. I just, you know, I think I've been very very inspired by your writing and your work ethic and the way that you show up in a room. And I'm grateful that I get to share it with everyone else. So thank you for being here. Thank you for showing. Mm-hmm.